This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, the eminent film educator Howard Suber, has recently retired after teaching film studies for more than 50 years at UCLA's prestigious School of Theater, Film, and TV. He's taught a significant number of influential filmmakers who've gone on to make some of the greatest movies and television shows of all time. Included on the list of Howard's many students are such notable creators as Francis Ford Coppola, Alexander Payne, David Kep. Alex Cox, Gregory Nava, and Gore Verbinski. I'm always proud to tell people I get to count myself among Howard's legion of students. Howard's classes were, without question, my favorites during my time at UCLA. Howard has also given the world two exceptionally important books for filmmakers, The Power of Film and Letters to Young Filmmakers. Next spring, he'll release a new book, which I predict will be much sought after, It's called Creativity and Copyright. So I am truly honored and humbled to have my mentor and my friend, Howard Suber, join me on StoryBeat today. Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm I'm honored and humbled to be here. (laughs) Well, let's start right out on a really lightweight topic. What is creativity? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we can do we can do that in maybe two, three minutes. Um, (laughs) Uh, two of my three books have have the word creativity in the title. And years ago, for several years, I taught a course in creativity that asked exactly that question. And over the years, um, I've suggested that, uh, although on the one hand I've taught 60-some different courses, but I usually say uh, at, at bottom my, my course is, is dealing with creativity because my students um, uh, certainly in I, I used to teach undergraduates but then I chaired a graduate program so for the last uh, 30 years let's say I've taught graduate students and um, uh, they consist of write, screenwriters uh, directors producers and so on maybe 75% of them are writers. Mm-hmm. And so I make it clear that my ultimate goal is to examine what's considered to be creative in what I refer to as memorable popular films. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, of course, have read over 50 years uh, more books than certainly I can remember now uh, not only on creativity, but on the mind and brain, which I've always been obsessed, uh, obsessed with. And uh, I actually can boil down your question uh, to um, probably less than a minute. Okay. Um, of all, this, all the books on creativity that I've read, there is... Uh, general agreement on the fact that creativity consists of creating something new that other people find valuable. Mm. Now, that's two different things. Uh, Anybody can create something new. Uh, That doesn't mean it's going to be considered valuable, and I'm using that word rather than good because I don't deal with good, uh, which is a a value judgment. And 
as anybody who knows the history of creativity in any field is aware, generally when you have something that's genuinely creative, uh, contemporaries are largely likely to reject it. Sure. And to say, uh, you know, that's not art, that scientific uh, idea uh, can't be true, etc. cetera. Uh, well, that's be- because, going back to the first part of the standard definition of creativity, you're creating something new. Right. And most people, including, in my experience, most creative people, who like to think of themselves as being totally open to the new and to new experiences and so on, um, have a limited openness. What do you mean by uh, limited openness? What does that mean? Well, to give you an example, um, some of the people listening to this, I assume, either are in uh, some educational institution where they are learning to be writers. So they're dealing with uh, the question of creativity in their daily lives, and Absolutely. they're trying to figure out for themselves, how can I be create, creative and how can I nurture my creativity and so on? Well. In my experience, having watched a long train of uh, practicing filmmakers come through UCLA and knowing a lot of of artists in other fields, it isn't necessarily the case that if you hire a distinguished writer, director, producer, whatever, that they're going to be very good good at teaching cre- a creative subject. Uh, it's a different different often, skill set, isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry. It's a different skill set, teaching and doing. It, exactly, different. exactly. And all too often, um, well, let's focus on screenwriting t- teachers or writing teachers in general. I wish I knew a few. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, w- um, what what happens sometimes um, is they come in and basically they they don't ever say this, but they communicate this by their actions. Uh, their advice to students is do what I do, and if you don't, then they are all too often likely to say well, this isn't good, this isn't really professional, meaning it's not what I'm used to. Um, and it's, it's a limitation uh, we all have because we're human beings and because people become conservative when they've got something to conserve. Mm-hmm. And if you ask somebody who has gotten uh, recognition and achievement for their creative work to help you develop your own creativity, they have a vested interest, and again, there's, this is a totally human phenomenon, they are likely to want to protect what made them somebody you wanted advice from in the first place. <laughs> yes. Early in my teaching career, which goes back to the middle 60s, Uh, So sometime in the late 60s or very early 70s, um, I I had John Ford come to a graduate seminar I was teaching in the Western. And at the time, uh, Ford was considered the greatest American director or certainly one of them, Uh, the American Film Institute, Uh, was founded around the time I'm talking about, and they gave their first Life Achievement Award to John Ford. Uh, And it wasn't too too much later that he died. In fact, I knew he he had cancer of the stomach when I had him to class. Um, And at the end of the class, I opened it up to 
questions from the students. And a woman raised her hand and asked what I now, from my present perspective, think of as the question, um, which uh, would-be creators always are going to ask some distinguished creator. Mr. Ford, she said, if you were starting in the film business today, how would you go about it? Well, that, of course, especially in the film business, um, is the uh, most important question and the most confusing question. <laughs> uh, and John Ford pretended to think for maybe 30 seconds. I say pretended because one of the things I also learned subsequently <coughs> is they get this question every time they agree to appear in front of an audience. And so it really is a matter of waiting so you can pretend you're mulling this over, and then you push button three uh, and out spews this recording uh, in your head. And he said, I would start in the prop department. <laughs> well, my students sort of clearly were shocked, and several of them looked back to me, looked back at me, I was in the back of the room, and, and sort of with furrowed brow said, what? Uh, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I, I, I smiled enigmatically, uh, but it, it was Mr. Ford's day, not mine. The next week, I said, so how did you, um, how did you like John Ford? And they said, wow, that's really great. He, you know, he's, such a, he's such an icon and so on. But, but then they said, as I expected they would, what was that about starting in the prop department? Yeah, how do you make money doing uh, that? <laughs> we've, yeah, we, we've heard uh, in those days, we've heard um, that if you want to get into the Hollywood film industry, you start in the mailroom at an agency, uh, or in television, you start as a page uh, in a live uh, radio or television program. Nobody had ever said to them, start in the prop department. So I, I said to them, look, in 1915, a young Irish lad, or his parents, had, had come over on the boat uh, from Ireland and gave birth to him. And a, a young Irish lad named Sean Aloysius O'Feeney was 18 years old and living in Maine and tried to, to figure out what would he do with his life. And, of course, like most people who were 18 years old, he didn't have any idea. Well, he had a brother out on the way out on the West Coast um, who was in this newfangled um, movie business. And he figured he'd he'd go visit his older brother and who knows he'd he'd see what was out there in california so he came out and his brother francis since this was really early in in hollywood's days uh, his brother francis was a director who got him a job in the carpentry shop <laughs> and his job was making props for films and there's so, how you learn. Fade out, <laughs> yeah. Fade out, fade in, to coin a phrase. Yes. Sixty years later, Sean Aloysius Ofini, who the year after he arrived in Hollywood changed his name to John Ford, uh, is asked by some uh, perky young lady, how would you go about doing this, getting into the motion picture business? And he says start in the prop department. And the point is that that's what we all do. Point, we, point out our, we, own, our own experiences. It's the only experience we have. What did John Ford know in the late 60s, early 70s, about how you would start in the film business uh, at that time? He hadn't had to think about that in 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 
the point is we all recapitulate our own lives. And to those young would-be screenwriters or writers in general who may be listening to your, your program, I would urge you to get whatever stories or advice you can from older people, but I would also urge you to recognize your world is not their world. Yep, you, get, you have, to take, you have how, to take it all with a grain of salt, don't you? And go out and find your yeah, own way. Well, it, it was their reality. And it was contingent upon the situations in the country, the field, uh, in their own lives, etc. I don't know of any other director in Hollywood history who started in the prop department. <laughs> well, you uh, know, you know, James Cameron started as a special effects guy. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, that's close, close enough. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're a young person and you, you of course, want somebody to tell you, how do I do this? Where do I start? Should I, should I start? Well, today nobody's talking about being a page on a, on a network and nobody's even talking anymore about starting in the mailroom at an agency. But people should be aware that we all recapitulate our own lives when we are of a certain age and somebody who's younger than us asks for advice. The only thing we really know is what we experienced in our own lives, and often it's just no longer relevant to the contemporary world. Well, as you know, Howard, I've been teaching for a number of years now here in Pittsburgh at Point yes. Park, and uh, I, I never tell anybody to do what I did. I always say to them, you're going to need Good. to find your own path. I can tell them what it is that I experience, but I don't ever tell them that's the way to do it, that they that there are a multitude of ways. And, and I will tell you that one of the things that we certainly talk about uh, in school, and we it's obvious to us that, that one of the, the sort of more effective ways to get seen these days is to can, is to go out where in in my youth and certainly when you were starting out it was a very very expensive proposition to go make a movie or a tv show today it's very uh-huh. very inexpensive and so uh-huh. people go out and make whatever shorts or mini movies or whatever they make even using their phones or uh, very inexpensive prosumer cameras and they put them up on youtube and that way they get seen and yes we didn't have distribution channels like that. So today's uh, methodology for um, getting your work out there so that somebody might hire you really is to go do it, just to go make movies. Uh, yeah, that's what I call the Goya principle. What does that mean? Get off your ass Get and your... do it. <laughs> uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, it, uh, this, the ability to make, call it an audiovisual something, uh, I'm trying to avoid film, movie, no. TV, and any any of the older names. I don't really, I don't know what we're going to call things uh, in a few years, but it could be something my, different. My theory is my theory is they are all motion pictures of one kind or another, and that they all yeah. are movies of one kind or another. What I avoid saying is go make a video, go make a film, because we're not using those mediums anymore. But but yeah. I do say movie or motion picture because we do, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm demonstrating my point about conservatism. I continue to talk about them all as film, mm-hmm. but that's just that's just because I've been doing it for 50 years. Well, you still see people on TV today saying, hey, we're going to take a look at the tape, and there is no tape. Yeah, right. You right, know? Right. And that's, they're not yeah. even talking about film. They're talking about a more modern medium, and, and it's gone. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, obviously creativity is all throughout us in our world. It's in science and business and engineering and architecture and so on and so on. It's in politics. It's everywhere. The arts are a particular thing that people go into that the creativity is um, part and parcel of it. 
Um, do you have a, after so many years of dealing with uh, all those students, do you have a sense of what drives a person to be in the arts or be in motion pictures? Do you have a sense of w why they risk becoming an artist despite such long odds that are obvious and, and right there? Oh, mental, mental instability. <laughs> well, well, I, I think I think I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, uh, because y you have to be crazy to want to be in film, video, television, whatever this medium is. Uh, it's like uh, some teenager or somebody, well, let's say, take a teenager. Some teenager uh, tells their parents, I want to win a gold medal in the Olympics. Well, people do, Absolutely. But, but everybody, including somebody who says that, knows is most people who want that are not going to achieve that. Uh, and the same thing is true for professional sports and the... the heights of Wall Street or being a bit, becoming a billionaire in any field that is enormously uh, rewarding, you are, of course, going to have enormous competition. Of course. And you're going to have the smartest and most talented and, and most aggressive and most you're going to have uh, people who are really good, uh, people who don't have the confidence that they're good in whatever it is they want aren't going to try. So people who say, I want to be a screenwriter or a director or whatever, or I want to, I want to play professional football or soccer or whatever, or I want to become a director or writer or producer or whatever, they have to have this supreme self-confidence. <laughs> Let me revise <laughs> that, Steve. They have to act as though they have this supreme confidence, mm -hmm. because one of the secrets uh, I learned a long time ago about my students. Um, and it's as hard to get into UCLA's screenwriting program as it is to get into Harvard Med School or Harvard Law School. Definitely. So we get people, we, we, it's one of the reasons I, until a month ago, uh, I spent 54 years there mm. because the students are just incredibly good. And so such a challenge and pleasure to be around. Indeed. Uh, but but I know that deep down inside, virtually all of them feel they're a fraud. And, and, and are tremendously neurotic and self-conscious. Well, you, you <laughs> should be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, because uh, you should especially be self-conscious because the gap, and this is true for any form of creation, and I suspect we'll come back to this, mm -hmm. uh, that anybody who wants to create it lives most of their life uh, with the recognition of, of the terrible gap between what they have inside their head that they want to accomplish and what the reality of their life is in terms of what they have accomplished. Amen. <laughs> and, and this is not something that goes away. Oh, no. Uh, no, in fact, it gets uh, worse sometimes because what you have achieved sometimes, if you have achieved something, you then have to get over that bar again. So it can get worse. Yeah, right. And, and deep down inside... So many creative people believe there is no deep down inside that the success I've had up to date was a fluke. 
I was lucky. Uh, they don't understand that I don't have another idea in my head. <laughs> uh, and, and pretty soon, I'm going to be exposed as a fr- as a fraud. And in the case of writers, this helps produce writer's block. And you have that on top of the enormous difficulties of getting anything made that costs a lot of money. So the principal requirement uh, to even get on the road to creating something is faith. Uh, and I don't, I, faith. I, I don't mean this in any religious sense. Mm-hmm. Faith, faith, by definition, is a belief in something you can't prove is real. If you could prove it was real, it wouldn't be called faith. Right. It would be called fact. Right. If you don't have faith, then you can't sit down and and start typing away or doing anything. Uh, You will succumb to a kind of despair, which comes from the root word uh, meaning hope. And you don't have hope. And again, hope is like faith. It's something that you want to happen. Oh, God, do creative people want to be creative? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it, it is, for most creative people I know, agonizing. This gap between the desire to create something new that other people recognize, and the reality, uh, especially when they're young, uh, uh, of their own life. But as you and I agreed a few minutes ago, even the people who become enormously successful are haunted. You know, Francis Coppola uh, did the the department at at the graduation ceremony some years ago gave him a honorary thing and he spent his whole graduation time talking about uh, how much in his life he's been depressed and afraid he would never be able to create something again isn't that interesting yeah uh, so it happens to the most successful people if you're not prepared to cope with depression, uh, if you're not prepared to face the challenge um, of feeling a total lack of hope, whether it's in the beginning and you're wanting somebody to recognize you, or whether you're in mid-career and you're trying to get funding for your next film. Well, that's Francis's story. By the way, he wasn't actually a, a student of mine, but uh, 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 he was just there at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we got to know each other. He gave me a lovely blurb that I put on the cover of the Power of Film, mm-hmm. and that's because we got to know each other when I started inviting him to class. Uh, But Francis Ford Coppola's professional career uh, is typical of successful directors in film history, of the most successful directors in film history, which is you spend most of your life, most of the time, while that clock is ticking, uh, trying to get funding to make your film. Sure. People have to be prepared to accept this. They think that once they're recognized, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get hired to write this and then the next thing and the next thing or direct the next thing and the next thing or the next thing. And I just have to say that all that I've seen of even... Um, because I've had hundreds of the biggest people at the time in, in film 
come to my classes, and they all tell pretty much the same story. You spend most of the time you have available pitching, yeah. trying to get somebody to give you the means of production, the money, uh, the cameras, the equipment, the venue to show it on. Um, there, it's not like a novelist. Well, no, can be novelist does where they want yeah. and, and and write and do their job. Yeah, and a movie director requires so much, re, so many resources, so many people, and all that, and it's a it is a well, much bigger deal than a, than, so than writing does, a novel. So does the screenwriter, Steve. You teach screenwriting. Yes, I'm going to embarrass you in front of your <laughs> students if right. they're listening. Oh, well, you know, at least one of them, maybe. <laughs> Do you really enjoy reading screenplays? Uh, m- most of the time, I wouldn't use the word enjoy. I'm good at it. <laughs> I wouldn't use it. Okay. It's not. It's not a. Um, it's not a. It, it isn't an enjoyable experience. It is a professional experience. Exactly. Okay. I rest my case. Uh, you know, that's that's what a screenwriters have to understand. A screenplay is. Not a thing. It's not literature. It's, it's a, not it's a, literature. It's a blueprint. Nobody wants to read screenplays other than young screenwriters in, in the making or people who are paid to do this mm-hmm. as part of their job, whether it's teaching screenwriting or being a, a reader or being a, a working for a producer who has you read screenplays. Uh, I, I equate it, and, uh, Howard, I equate it to architects. Yeah. Uh, uh, nobody wants yeah. to live in a blueprint of a building. They want to <laughs> live in the building. And, exactly. And so exactly. The, the blueprint is, is only interesting to the contractors, and the contractors in, in the world of movie and TV are directors, producers, stars, uh, makeup people, etc. Those are the contractors. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... The bottom line of that train of thought is if you write a novel and you finish it, uh, you've written a novel. And you can get it uh, on, available on Amazon that, who will print it on demand. They'll wait until somebody actually pays them and they'll print a single copy Mm -hmm. or you can get a small publisher or you may get a big publisher or whatever but the gap between doing it the it is the novel it's it's something people do read and now your job simply is getting people to read your 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 novel a screenplay is not a thing I think your ex- your analogy to being an architect is, is exactly right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you you uh, you don't have a satisfactory life if if in your old age you say, "Well, I really designed a, a lot of really great buildings." None of them were built, but I really exactly, know how to exactly right. design a great building. Well, you know, it's uh, if I, I tell my students, if you really want to control your work, if you want to be the person that absolutely makes the decisions, go write short stories or a novel. Uh, if you if you want to have total control over your art, go be a painter. Nobody's going to change uh-huh. your painting, um, but if you want to, if you want to be in movies and TV, it's a collaborative medium. It is not a solo person's medium, and you have to be willing to not only give yourself up to that particular beast or that process. Um, you have to be willing to subvert yourself in it, and that's um, frequently a challenge psychologically for people. And one one of the one of the high hurdles one of the high hurdles I got over relatively early in my writing career was I I I mean I wrote ninety teleplays or so and um, early on I stopped feeling like they were mine or that they were precious 
that I was a I was a gun for hire, and if you wanted to hire me and pay me, you could do with it whatever you wanted. I needed to adopt that attitude, not to feel like my precious work was being stolen or or, or wrecked or ruined or whatever whatever attitude you might have taken that day. So, mm -hmm. it, yep. Well, uh, you're one of the fortunate ones uh, because, in my experience, and this is especially true of writers and directors uh, it's it's a boring cliche to say film or television is a collaborative medium uh, everybody knows that everybody says that but it's true and far too many young writers directors etc give it lip service but they don't really believe it's true mm, it's all about them well, well, I used think to teach is. a course uh, <laughs> called Strategic Thinking in the Film and Television Industries. Oh, I, or I, took, it. I like, took it. I took it. Great class. You took it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but the subtitle of that was, Is There Life After Film School? Mm -hmm. And it was the largest course um, uh, that I taught. Uh, and I, I would begin on the first day by passing out a sheet of paper, and I said, don't put anything that identifies you on this paper. Just respond uh, in a word association fashion to the uh, the words on the page. And the words were writer, director, actor, lawyers, producers, uh, studio executives, etc., agents. Um, and then I'd have the TA quickly skim through and give me the one, give me half a dozen that I could read to the class, and uh, I would invite the class to imagine which program the writer of this resp these responses was in. So, um, um, directors. Egomaniacs who think they're God. Uh, <laughs> lawyers. Blood-sucking people with no creativity. Uh, writers. King of the heap. Uh, most important person. Guess, and I'd say, guess what major uh, this person <laughs> is in. And, and, and then, you know, I, I would go on for a while until people got the point. And... Uh, when I figured they had enough, I would stop and say, if I gave you a sheet of paper that said uh, African Americans, Latin Americans, Jews, uh, Republicans, etc., uh, and you gave me this kind of dismissive, snarky um, response to everybody who is in a category that wasn't your own, you would be shocked. <laughs> um, but if you have the attitude that I, the screenwriter, am the most important person in this process, or I, the director, which many directors do, you can't do a film, even a low-budget film. And I've spent years... Uh, every so often with films I was going to discuss in class, uh, going to the Internet Movie Database uh, website and looking at how many names there are in the credits for the film. Mm -hmm. And having done it for many years, um, I can say that even so-called low-budget films or independent films uh, on average, have 200 credits. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, of course, the multi-million dollar films have two to 3,000 oh, yeah. credits. The idea that you can make a film or a television series by yourself, or even one in which you are the most crucial, the most crucial person in that process, if that's the idea you have, you're really headed for self-destruction. The, 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 I, I will. I totally agree with you. I think there is no such thing as a 
person who is uh, the the one and only indispensable person. However, that said, yeah. it's pretty hard yeah. to make a movie of any kind or a TV show without somebody or several somebodies having an idea and putting it into a form that is actually you know producible. Oh yeah. Yeah, so I totally you, agree with that, too. So without uh, that, you have nothing. All those 2,000 people on your big-budget movie, they're just standing around with nothing to do. So, Yeah, but I totally agree, and um, um, I think we will eventually come back to what is creativity uh, because we're leading towards it right here in this, this part of the discussion, mm-hmm. uh, which is creativity inherently um, incorporates contradictions and contraries. So the most important word in dramatic storytelling is the word but. That's uh, the conflict. So word. following what you just said, yes, I agree with what you said, absolutely, 100%. Uh, but, but, Steve... <laughs> How much of the cost of producing the typical film goes to the writers? Oh, a tiny percentage. Uh, three to four yeah, percent is yeah. the current answer. Used to be as low as two to three percent. Uh, that includes. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I wait a minute. Are you saying that the actors don't just make it up? <laughs> no, I'm sorry to tell you, they don't. Okay, good. good, um, good. And, and in fact, um, the number of stories about ad-libbing on the set are often, they make good stories. But I used to show, um, I had the raw footage uh, from Apocalypse Now, right. which was like hours and hours and hours and hours of stuff. And Marlon Brando, considered the greatest actor of his day, um, was brought onto the set, and couple of agreed to pay him a million dollars for I forget a few days shooting. And Brando was notorious for not learning his lines. Well, he he showed up on the set. Of course, he hadn't even read the script. And he also weighed, like, uh, making this up, 300 pounds. Oh, he did. He weighed uh, 300 pounds. He, he was enormously fat. And Coppola had this big dramatic ending um, where uh, Brando and Martin Sheen were going to be fighting the Viet Cong with, uh, uh, with machine guns at the end, going out in a blaze of glory. But the idea of showing Brando without a shirt um, <laughs> meant the film would have ended up with a huge derisive laugh. So he had to throw a script out, which every director needs to be prepared for. And he had, uh, but meanwhile, he had his crew that he was paying a great amount of money to, and he was paying it out of his own pocket because nobody would finance the film. Uh, and he ultimately went bankrupt because of it. So he he had Brando lie down um, on a s- stone slab and had the cameraman shoot him just in close-up so his big fat belly didn't show in the shot and had him ad-lib lines. And I used to show my students these clips and and i'd say to them uh i've got an hour and a half worth of this you uh if you want me to show it all i'll show it or you can tell me when to stop brando would start a line he would get to the next line and it'd be kind of interesting and then he'd pause and try and ad lib a third line and he would produce something that would cause my students just to roll in the aisle. <laughs> Even the greatest of actors is not great at ad-libbing. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, uh, so, 
No, the actors don't make up the lines. No, they do not. But, but you knew that. I, of course. I was being a little facetious. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, the, um, yeah, I, 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 kinda... I, I just wanted to, I wanted to mention one of the other things. Sure. Uh, just so your writing listeners have a, um, a sense of reality about what it, about the world they want to become part of. Um, not, not only uh, is a tiny fraction, to put it in context, three to four percent of the production budget is generally the cost of the errors and omission insurance policies that distributors require you to have on your film, just in case you say something that causes somebody to sue the makers of the film. Right. So it's it's a mark. I'm, uh, I'm trying to phrase this in a way that doesn't totally contradict what you said a few minutes ago about the importance of the script. Several of my former students uh, became professional readers in the film television industry. Right. And I would ask them, um, now there is a union if you become a full-time reader, and full-time readers do not get paid a lot of money. And then there's a lot of reading that gets done by freelancers. And I would ask the people, um, you, you get hired full-time after you've spent a long time as a freelancer. And I'd say, so what do you get paid per script? The answer used to be $25 a script. I think recently... Uh, well, maybe 10 years ago it was 50. Maybe it's 100 now. Um, I'm not sure it's that high. But my question is, that's all you're paying somebody to read a whole script and give you a three-page report and recommendation on whether they should themselves, the producer, the studio, read this thing? Well, if you're only willing to pay 50 bucks, 100 bucks to have this job done, it doesn't indicate you have a lot of confidence <laughs> that you're going to be interested well, in anything. Well, that's exactly right. Be yeah. Most, most of the time, well, you know, you know as well as anybody that uh, it's infrequent that out of the slush pile comes uh, something that turns into a greenlit project. Most of the time, those projects are either developed by people or they're brought in by people they already trust. They're not coming in through the slush pile. Exactly. So that leads us to the dilemma that your students and my students universally answer to. So how do I break through? Um, and a lot of young people who haven't had you and me as instructors uh, a lot of them think, well, they've heard this is a business of who you know. So they go to uh, public events where there's a panel, uh, where there's going to be, let's say, some screenwriters talking, and they go up afterwards or in the break and introduce themselves, thinking they're going to get to know, know a screenwriter or producer or a student or network executive in this way, it is a business of who you know. Indeed. Every business is a business of who you know. Indeed. If I, if I was visiting in Pittsburgh and I had a terrible toothache, would I go online and look for the word dentists? No, I'd call you up, Steve, and I'd say... Do you can you recommend a dentist? You know a dentist, so that's how I'm going to choose. Uh, so it, on the one hand, is a business of who you know, but even more importantly, it's who knows you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how does somebody get to know you? Well, uh, if you're in Southern California or New York. Uh, you 
you usually think the way to do this, and I'm not saying this is not the way to do this, uh, you spend a lot of energy trying to get an agent or a manager because they're the gatekeepers. Um, and, they, and, and they know a lot more people than you do. Well, in addition to that, if you send in your script, what's going to happen, Steve? Uh, it'll go right into the trash can. Uh, I've, uh, Over the transom? Remember I, have a, remember, I have a book on copyright coming out. So yeah, yes. Well, they don't. They do don't want to. They don't want to touch it because they don't have. There, there's nobody yeah. that says that it's le that's legitimately yours. Yeah, actually, today I don't think they would put it in a trash can. They would send it back with register, registration documents requiring uh, a signed acknowledgement that you received this back, and in, in and your script, the envelope would not be opened Correct. that it was in. Sure. In in any company that knew what it was doing, and you, you would get a what is clearly a form letter saying, I'm sorry, we don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. Does anyone actually <laughs> submit uh, paper scripts anymore? Well, that's another point. That's a good point. I'm showing my age. <laughs> uh, well, certainly, um, you're going to get an email back that says, sorry, we don't accept any submissive. And there would be something lawyers cooked up for them that was boilerplate uh, lawyer, lawyeries uh, that said, uh, uh, we are returning your email. We have not opened uh, the, the uh, document you attached to it. Uh, it is our company policy not to do this. And, uh, and they would find a way of documenting that they did not even open the thing. Right, exactly. Because uh, um, I've done a lot of work over the last 40, 50, 40 years um, as an expert witness in copyright suits, and too many of them began by usually some unknowledgeable young employee opening, uh, in the old days, opening the envelope, or today would be they pressed the, they would open the attachment. But in any case, like any other business, of course, it's who you know, uh, but beyond that, it's who knows you. And uh, so, so the question for the young screenwriter is, well, how do I get people to know me? Well, let's explore that. <laughs> what would you say? Uh, I would say that the that well, there is no tr there is no you know one way or a perfect path, but uh, certainly if you're, it's helpful to be in a place where there are people actually um, looking for that kind of work. So that means you need to be in either Los Angeles or New York, typically, although it can happen in other places. I would say then it's important that you do figure out how to get to know people. So how does that work? So you either start to volunteer to give your time free to productions where they need volunteers and you can meet all sorts of people and ultimately start to find a friends that can refer you to people because the, as far as I know, the very best way to get your work seen by anyone is to have it have your either you or your work referred by someone who's already familiar with a person in power uh, mm -hmm. to to them. So references and i.e. Uh, you know it's who you know. Uh, that is yeah. that is exactly the the probably the best way to do it. Um, and so I, it gives you an amorphous answer because there is no right answer. But that's among right. the best ways, yeah. especially for those starting out. Or to work in an office somewhere in the business where you get to know the people of the business. And they yeah. will they will either determine that they like you or they don't. And if they don't like you, you've got a big problem. If they do like you, then <laughs> you will easily get referred to other people when you say, hey, can you introduce me to so-and-so? They'll do that. And then they that person up the chain will trust that you're someone that they can um, feel comfortable with. Uh and it, it is usually a comfort level. 
uh, my experience has been it's it's, a, it's yeah. almost always a comfort level on the person who you're meeting. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that well, I the other thing that I tell students which I think is uh, still holds true when you are given the opportunity to take a meeting whether you're a producer or a writer or a director it doesn't matter when you're given the opportunity in Hollywood to take a meeting with someone they assume that you've gotten to the point of getting in their door they assume you have talent what they want to find out is do you have something that they can work with? And then more importantly, are you someone they, they would like to work with as well? And those mm-hmm. those factors separate sometimes uh, people from getting work and not, even though the work may not be the best work that comes in the door. Uh, and so uh, talent is not, you know, not the major part of the equation. The major part of the equation once you're in the door is do they like you or not? So it becomes a personality mm-hmm. game too. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. I would hope that would not lead anybody who who hears that to think that means um, I have to learn how to smile and have a firm handshake. Uh, I I I hate to tell you, but I think it does mean that, and that 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 being a sociable. Listen, you you know as well as I do. You've dealt with plenty of students in your time. Um, who need to learn how to be more social or socialized. And, well, yes. And, and yes. unfortunately, those people have a harder time succeeding than people who are socialized. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, but what I was referring to is that helps, uh, having a firm handshake and a great smile. Uh, but ultimately... Uh, they're not going to hire you because you have a great hand. No, 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 no. And I, still, correct. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to imply that at all. I, what I meant yeah. is that when you do get in the door, they assume that you have something to offer to them. The question is, what is it? But then on top yeah, of exactly. it, the, 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 on top of it, they want to determine: Are you somebody that scares them? Are you somebody that is? Uh, a pleasant person? Are you somebody that that really excites them? They want. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to determine whether you're someone who they think they. Well, here's the bottom line, as you well know, that they are looking to see if you're someone that they can make money with, and yeah, and exactly. frequently that's an utterly intangible thing that you can't you can't you know prepare yourself for other than to be you and hope that that works. Yeah. Well. Once again, I totally agree. <laughs> um, the one of the things I'd say uh, from a, uh, a five-decade-long retrospective view of dealing with literally thousands of very smart, very, very. Uh, Talented? Well, I'm trying to avoid that word, but okay. Uh, talented people is too many of them. It, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about really understanding that it is a collaborative business. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's not just something you give lip service to, but you, you live it. Well, the second thing I would say is in film, television, whatever we're talking about, you have to pay your dues. For sure. And once again, and once again, this is, has nothing to do with Hollywood, the networks, uh, film, or whatever we call this thing. This is life. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, you go through a, uh, uh, when you're young, you're given the 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 jobs nobody else wants to do you 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 work incredible hours if you're a young lawyer same thing in any field uh to quote the godfather you have to earn your bones mm-hmm. you and and what this means is you got to do a lot of shit that nobody else wants to do that is for sure and you got to do it willingly with a smile pretending you like it, although they know you don't like it, 
but that's what I had to do, and that's what you have to do. When students I've known win some kind of competition, we have, we have the Samuel Goldwyn Awards um, uh, that we've had forever, and it's quite a prestigious thing, and it's been around more than a cent, half a century. So, so it often means that uh, uh, somebody who wins the first, second, or third uh, prize will find themselves uh, with several agents or managers occasionally a producer, calling them up and inviting them to lunch. And when students talk to me uh, about this, I say, first of all, that's great, and I mean that. That's great. Uh, this is a door that looks like it might be open. Um, at least they're treating you with respect. Right. You, you won this contest. So I respect you because you won this contest. Exactly. Contest. But I prepare them for the fact that uh, my observation from watching this process is that what's usually going to happen is they're going to take you to a nice restaurant. They're going to tell you, I love your script. Uh, and then sometime during the conversation, they're going to tell you in, in good old Hollywood fashion, I love you. And they're going to say, I love your script, but, the most important word in storytelling, <laughs> yes. but I don't know how to sell it. What else have you got? Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're crestfallen uh, because what, of course, they want is, all right, I'm getting the recognition. I got this recognition that says I'm really hot stuff. Um uh, and this person's contacting me because they think this was a prestigious award and I must be hot stuff. Now they're telling me, I love, I love you, I love your stuff, but I don't know how to make it. What else have you got? Oh, Christ. They were lying to me. They don't like my stuff. They don't love me. They're just giving me that Hollywood shit. <laughs> uh, and, in, in, in other words, hello, he lied. Um, which is I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember the the producer who wrote that book, but it's one of our better producers wrote the book called yeah. "Hello, He Lied." Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm forgetting her name. Female producer. Oh, yeah, yeah. People who are taking you to lunch are spending many days of their week taking other people to lunch. And they're just as talented as you are, and they write just as well as you do. Maybe, maybe not, but I think uh, a little humility is in order. And, uh, and so you have to be prepared for the fact that it takes a long time, and this is true of creativity in general. People who write biographies uh, or journalism about really successful creative people have a vested interest in the boy or girl genius myth. You know, they uh, they sat down and uh, uh, if if uh, if the first screenplay you wrote was last summer, well, you're likely to get a bigger article in a, in a newspaper than if, if you took 10 years before you sold your first screenplay. Sure. Who wants to hear that story, uh, that it took you 10 years to sell your first work? Well, uh, in fact, do you tell your students how long it takes to get a film made, Steve? Absolutely. Oh, no, we're, we're, we, there, there's no uh, hiding reality at school here. Um, Good. No, Good. we we're, we're, well, we 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 tell them exactly what it is. Some of them look at us like we're crazy, like we don't know what yeah. we're talking about. But but nevertheless, because they don't have the experience to know, and then they go out and find it out. <laughs> but it takes yeah. takes a really really long time to get any. It takes a long time to write a script. It takes a long time to get it uh, bought. It takes a long time to get it produced. It takes a long time, many years. Yeah, 
I, I once figured out when I started the producer's program, I went to all the classes we offered, and, and the producer's program courses usually were structured by having a, a guest from the industry every week. So we had in a typical year three or 400 hot shots from the industry. Wow, that's a lot. So I, I was able to, to look for a pattern, and almost invariably, since we were inviting people who were head of a studio or something or had a, had a film that was in release that week uh, that was doing, uh, that at least had visibility, uh, I started noticing how often people would say, you know, this film, meaning this thing that motivated you to ask me to come to this class, took me x number of years they didn't say x but uh, when i started putting them together i realized that the vast majority of them were saying it took me nine years to get this film made it's mm-hmm. about right and when i yeah and when i say that to students uh, I, I i ask them how long does it take to get a film made i often get somebody who will say oh a year and a half two years I said, I didn't ask how long it takes to make a film, which is to say the days you're in production and how long post-production is before you get it into distribution. I asked you how long it takes to get the film made. And, uh, and, and then I get all kinds of figures. When I say nine years, is the average, they're often gas. But when you think about it, this is the most expensive art form there is oh, yes. outside of architecture yes that's, right. that's uh, right and and there's a good reason why architecture is a good comparison for film uh, because both of them require large sums of money and both of them have plans or blueprints or a screenplay that are not a finished anything um, and it requires a lot of time and a lot of money to go from paper uh, to an actual uh, thing that exists, and lots of people, and, and lots of people who are experts on lots of individual disciplines. Absolutely, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how uh, writers, directors, producers, stars, um, etc all spend most of the time in their professional lives waiting. Yes. You wait for a screenplay that you you think will make a, 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 a movie that will make its money back, let alone making a profit. Uh, then you have to wait for a director. The director has to wait for the star or stars he or she wants. Uh, you have to wait for the financiers to give you the money. You have to wait for a composer. You have to wait, etc. You everybody waits, uh, and the waiting can take years, literally. And and this gets worse, Steve. And I, since I go back so far uh, throughout most of my life, when I went into a movie theater, uh, it would begin with the Trump fanfare or the MGM lion. I'm sorry, what, did I say Trump fanfare? You did, you said Trump, but you meant trumpet, and I knew you meant trumpet. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it began with the Fox fanfare, dum da dum da 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 dum et cetera, uh, or MGM or Warners or Universal or whatever, and it would say 20th Century Fox Presents. Then you get the title of the film. You go into a movie theater today, and aside from the franchise films, uh, where they've bought the intellectual property to a comic book uh, series, uh, aside from those, you are likely to see Schmidlap Productions Presents. Schmidlap. Uh, then you get a title of some Chinese company that's trying to disguise the fact that it's Chinese. Um, then you get 
a German uh, or British uh, or Scandinavian company, and then you get, uh, and so on. Um, I calculate that it takes um, an average today of five production entities who have each put up some money to get the damn thing made. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, these are scattered around the world. What does that mean? It means the producer, or the other thing that keeps growing is the number of producer credits on films uh, and television. Uh, It means the producers have been traveling on planes for literally years, going from country to country, saying, here's my pitch, here's the film, here's the director, stars, etc. You want a piece of the action. And uh, that all takes time. Of course, it has nothing to do with the script. Um, Well, that's not quite true, because often the producer comes back and says, you know, I almost had uh, funding from the Chinese, but they need a rewrite because they didn't like blah, blah, blah. Uh, And so meanwhile... A script is being rewritten to satisfy people who have money. But, uh, boy, this sounds like a real downer, this conversation. (laughs) No, it sounds like a realistic conversation. I was going to say, I was going to add to this, that there's a reason why legitimate, successful producers in Hollywood have not one project in the pipeline, not two, but dozens of projects in the pipeline because it takes so long to get any one of them to go. So when you yeah. when you learn anything about producers, you find out that they have many, many projects in various stages of pre-production, et cetera, or sales or whatever. Um, and it's yeah. the only way that they can survive. They can't do it off of one thing. They have to do it off of many. Yeah. Uh, and um, it, 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 though though directors they may have two or three, but very few directors have dozens of movies waiting to go. I mean, maybe Steven Spielberg does, uh, but most directors are lucky if they have one getting ready to go. So that those worlds c- collide every once in a while, producers and directors, in terms of what they what their needs are. And so the yeah. the, the industry itself has become um, more about these. Uh, very, very large productions and very, very small productions, and not so much in between yeah. anymore, which is a shame, I think, yeah. but, but it is what it is. And, and the too often, uh, especially, again, I'm talking about young, younger people, too often, to rephrase what you just said, the producer is working in serial fashion. Correct. Uh, they have multiple things going out. I guess in terms of comparing it to computers, that's parallel construction. But in any case, the point is they're working on multiple things because only some of them are ever going to move uh, to the goal of actually being made. And and we go back to the fact the producers are waiting and waiting for a star, a director, or whoever. The poor writer, however, works sequentially, and it's very rare that a writer will work on even two different scripts uh, in the same time frame. It's very hard to Uh, do that, though it does happen, though. Yeah, yeah, but but that means that the the writer is involved in moving usually a single project along to the next step. Yeah. And then that process stops, and it would be nice if writers could then immediately start work on their next script. But that doesn't uh, happen too frequently either. <laughs> yes, it, unfortunately. Sometimes, it, it sometimes they have to regenerate an idea, and sometimes nobody wants to hire them, and sometimes it's both. So, uh, yeah, writers, writers are always in a very precarious position Uh, both um, physically, financially, and psychologically. Uh, The really top writers, which are few and far between, they make enough money that they can sit back and relax a little bit. But most uh, meat and potatoes professional writers, they've got a 
a very, very difficult task ahead of them, which is that you're always trying to reinvent the wheel. And uh, it's, it becomes a, it can become a, a very invigorating uh, and sometimes debilitating struggle to keep a, a balance on that. And I, I know from my own personal experience, I went through lots of years where I had more projects than I could, you know, uh, could handle, but I handled them anyway. And um, years where there was little or nothing. And so you have to figure out how to balance and just keep working through it. Well, Howard, um, yeah. we've been talking for 80 minutes, believe it or not, and we're coming oh. toward the end okay. of the show. And um, okay. I, I just wonder, um, you know, we talked about, uh, I love the John Ford story that you told earlier. Do, yeah. do, you, do you have any other weird or quirky or oddball stories you might be able to throw our way? <laughs> uh, another anecdote. How about Orson Welles? Oh, yeah, let's hear about Orson. In my entire career, I have only twice devoted a whole graduate seminar to a single film or a series. The first was Citizen Kane very early in my career, and the second was the Godfather series uh, about midway. Every week we would look at a different aspect of, of the film, writing one week, directing another, and so on. Um, so I was, uh, as was true of many people of my generation, um, overwhelmed by Citizen Kane. I know it seems slow and out of date today, so I don't, I don't force it on people, but it had an enormous influence on my life and was one of the reasons I, I got in, involved with film. Um, and uh, I even worked on a book on Citizen Kane with Pauline Kael, the critic. Wow, but, uh, the great Pauline uh, Kael. Uh, well, it wasn't so great. Uh, <laughs> she took some of my stuff and, uh, uh, well, you can go online and look for my name and her name to find the rest of that story. But um, the... Uh, I wanted to get to Orson Welles for decades. I tried to get to Orson Welles for decades. Um, I only learned like 20-some years later that the reason I didn't get to Welles uh, was because he had signed a contract with Peter Bogdanovich uh, that gave Peter... The, exclusive rights to Wells, and so I was being blocked from getting to Wells, huh. uh, and one of the ironies was I arranged to hire Peter when he was a young and starving critic to teach a course at UCLA, huh. but in any case, fade out, fade in, uh, this is, oh, it's probably 30 years after that course. I finally was able to get through to Wells. It was at the time he was shooting The Other Side of the Wind, which is just, where has it just been shown? I, I, uh, I don't know, but it's just about uh, to be released, yeah. Yeah, I think it was shown at Venice last week. Um, uh, maybe this week. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that so that's like 20 years ago now. I may be way off on the on the numbers, but in any case, uh, I chaired a search committee uh, to hire a new faculty member for the for the directing program, and I said to the then chair of the department and dean of the school. Uh, I'd like to hire Orson Welles. And they laughed and said, you'll never get Orson Welles. And, uh, and I said, well, I'd like to try. So I was able to track him down and arrange to have lunch with the dean, the chair, and me at Mommy's Own Restaurant, which was, it was at the time a very famous place uh, where it was well known that he he had his table, 
And so we met, and uh, I told him, we're not hiring you, we're not offering you a job to talk about the old days, and you don't have to ever mention Citizen Kane, because he told me he was sick of talking about it, which is what I figured. And I said, we'd like to hire you uh, to actually continue shooting the other side of the wind using our sound stages as long as you would let some of our students uh, assist you and be on the set and watch you work. He said, I'll do it. I learned uh, several days later that he was on our sound stages two days later uh, shooting scenes from the other side of the wind. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'd like time to prepare what he called my lesson plans. And uh, we said, fine. So So he suggested, how about we meet again a week from today? Let's say it was a Thursday. Um, and then we said, fine. And so we were going to meet at noon at Mommy's Own for a second time. About 8 o'clock in the morning, the dean calls me and said, Howard, Orson died last night. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, uh, and um, the woman who he was living with, whose name escapes me, told the dean... She found him slumped over his typewriter, typing out the lesson plan he planned to bring to the meeting. Oh, no. (laughs) And then, uh, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this, but, uh, and and then the dean said, son of a bitch, never finished anything. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, I've since read (laughs) other... Other tales of how Wells died, um, so uh, I only have uh, what I got from the dean the morning he died, and the dean is dead. So, so, uh, so, so, so we can we can safely say that you had something to do with killing Orson Wells. <laughs> well, I hate to say it, there've been other major people who died. Uh, <laughs> Shortly after I tried to bring them to UCLA, <laughs> but anyway, the point the point I wanted to make about that story um, was as uh, the waiter brings the check, and I'm pretty sure uh, since it was a well known scuttlebutt in the industry that Orson Welles sat in this table right near the front of this famous restaurant. I'm pretty sure he probably had a deal where he signed the chit and they threw it away and uh, he it was worth it to have him pimping the, the restaurant oh, for them. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. So anyway, the waiter comes over and as he's signing the check, I said to him, "Why why haven't you taught any place else?" Cuz he had already said yes. And he said, nobody else ever asked me. Wow. Uh, and the point, which I guess is my my uh, ending point, is uh, Goya, get off your ass and ask. Yeah. Uh, don't assume that just because you have somebody you are sure won't do this, that you're right you don't know just do it what and have you got what have you got to lose right yeah exactly but we're people are so afraid of hearing no well that of course is why the industry nobody in the industry ever says no you know this <laughs> they all say no <laughs> well they don't say the word no they pass. They pass. Yes. They pass. A more genteel phrase. It doesn't sting quite as much to hear the word spoken, but just don't assume the answer is no. The, 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 my other pet, pet peeve phrase that just everybody uses is, it's not for us. Yeah. 
Right. So whatever that means, it means <laughs> it means pass. Yeah. It means we're not yeah. interested. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Or so, it just doesn't fit into our schedule. Exactly. <laughs> so Howard, this has been um, a, an unbelievably wonderful um, ninety minutes or so, yeah, and right. and we it has been one long series of what I think of as great tips and advice on top of just great stories. Um, And if you don't, if you're out of any kind of tips or advice because you've given them all, then we'll let that go. But do you have a last tip or a piece of advice for anyone trying to make it in the business or trying to get better at it? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, And given my concern that this conversation is too much of a downer, um, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you one last anecdote. Okay. Um, it's one you heard before, uh, when you took the, the strategy course with me. And it's, it's one that I've told for years because I know, um, because I've had so many people that I just bump into on the street years later tell me they remembered some years ago, I get a phone call from a reporter for I forget what. I've done a fair amount of interviewing in my life. And and the reporter identifies himself and says he's writing a story on um, graduates of the big three or big five, whatever it was, film schools, and the difference between those who make it and those who don't. And so he contacted the department, who even way back then told him I was, I'd been there the longest. Uh, and so I had all this years of uh, being able to experience people, and so that's why he was calling me. So his question was, could I tell him the difference between those who made it, make it and those who don't? Well, I said to him, my first response was, um, I assume by make it you want me to now rattle off the r- rich and famous students I've known. I don't do that <laughs> because I don't want to claim I had anything to do with their their success. So I won't even mention them. He said, oh, well, how do you define make it? Uh, I said, I define make it... Um, by saying, if they are gainfully employed, at least some of the time, doing the thing they came to the UCLA Film School to do in, in something related. So if they came to the screenwriting program, they're writing someplace and making a living out of it. They made it, even though you, the reporter, never heard of them. He said, okay, I got it. So, can you tell me what the difference is between those who made it and those who don't? Is it um, talent? And I said, I would never say the difference was talent. No, nope, right. Right, no. It's not uh, talent. Intelligence? Absolutely not. Um, and this kind of, this kind of back and forth uh, went on for like 10 minutes. And finally, in frustration, this guy said, Professor Suber, can you tell me the difference between those who make it, as you define it, and those who don't? And I paused uncharacteristically. Uh, I didn't have anything to say for a long time. And I realized... He says, I didn't know the answer to that question. And as I think often happens in life, if you admit to yourself you don't know the answer, an answer then occurs to you. And I said, I think it's how people handle despair. Mm. He said, what? I said, I think it's how people handle despair. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, and I told him what I've already told you, which you already knew, that we get an incredibly gifted, talented group of people who 
we have the luxury of admitting the, uh, into the UCLA Film School. And they're used to being patted on the head and told, what a good boy, what a good girl you are. Oh, you're so smart, you're so clever, you're so creative. Uh, so they come to us. This is the competence thing we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation. They come to us knowing they're good, having lived a life in most cases uh, where they got feedback that said, you're hot stuff. And they go through the screenwriting or writing or producing program, and they're out in the real world, and they many things we've been talking about. They they don't know anybody. They don't know how to make contacts. Uh, they don't know where to begin. How do you get to a position where somebody is going to know who the hell you are, let alone buy your stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, and part of the part of the life of somebody who's been fortunate enough to have been encouraged by teachers and other authority figures in your life is that you probably went to college, since I'm talking about graduate school here, uh, you went to college with people who went on to become doctors and lawyers and engineers and so on. And you show up at a uh, uh, reunion and and uh, uh, you know your doctor friend is talking about how he's gotten married and has, has his first kid and he's bought a house and the lawyer friend's doing the same thing and they're with such and such a firm and you're sitting there uh, notable by your silence and you're just not saying anything and finally uh, people notice you haven't said a thing so how are you doing? And you say, well, well, um, 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 what do you say? You don't say, I don't have an agent, I don't have a manager, I'm getting no place. You say, well, I, uh, I've got some interest in my, in my script on such and such, or I'm talking to people about, or I'm over at Paramount uh, uh, working with a producer, whatever stuff, but you know this is really bullshit. <laughs> And you go home, and uh, as, an old, as in an old-fashioned movie, there's this echo chamber effect voice that comes on and says, ah, ha, 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 big shot, you are going to Hollywood to become a big shot. Where are you now? <laughs> and you fall into despair. Well, everybody falls into despair. Um, the question is, there, uh, or the defining act, is that some people are able to persevere in the face of despair, and other people are not able to. Uh, this is an industry in which Lots of people toss around terms like a failed writer uh, a lot. Well, my experience with tons of creative people is nobody really fails, they quit. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, they just leave time, town. Uh, they never get in touch with me because they're afraid I... I'll think less of them because they're doing so, which is, which is not true. I mean, sometimes despair is a rational response to the condition of your life. And the question is, are you going to succumb to the despair, or are you going to keep on persevering and trying to come through the other end? And... Uh, so that's why it isn't talent, it isn't intelligence, it isn't personality. Um, it's 
how you react to the inevitable despair that's part of this life in this intensely competitive industry. And if you and if you going back to my analogy of wanting to win a gold medal in the Olympics or wanting to uh, play for professional sports, uh, I'm sure that anybody who has that as a goal has experienced despair at many times. Because you don't win them all. Yeah. And so uh, people are often shocked when they discover they're in despair and think this is something really terrible and unique about them. But it's the commonest thing around. And so I think uh, being able... um, being able to keep on going when you're not getting from the world the kind of feedback you want to hear, you want a pat on the head, you want somebody to say you're doing good. Uh, Being able to persevere when you're not getting that, of course, determines whether you're ever going to get to that gold medal you were after. So I I think... uh... Uh, what you're saying is abundantly true. I also think that another way to say it would be the word you used a moment ago, which is that uh, that you're ha- able to deal with despair and overcome despair. And the key then is, is the ability to persevere and to, to, to weather those storms. And I, I think I alluded to it a little earlier that, there, that as a, a writer, you frequently find yourself between jobs, a professional writer. And so what, right. do, what do you do in that time? Do you uh, go and get yourself deeply into drugs? Hopefully not. Do you go get yourself uh, into a whole other career? Hopefully not. What, what one hopes as a writer is, is that you keep writing and that you're then able to continue to find your way to the next gig. But it, but it is a question of perseverance and, and um, somehow ignoring all of those negatives that are around you at that time. Um, and yeah. So as people, people used to say to me, Howard, um, well, how are you dealing with this when you're not working right now? And I'd say, well, I'm always working. I'm just not getting paid. And and that's a that's a big key, I think, to always be working yep. even if you're not getting paid. Um, and th- it's kind of like um, Stephen King famously gets asked the question, uh, why do you write all these horror stories? And his answer is, what makes you think I have a choice? <laughs> and, and I say yeah. the same thing about perseverance. If your heart and soul are into doing this, then you probably don't really have a choice. Uh, and and the question is, is whether you can tough that out before all your money runs out, before your family leaves you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right. I right. think this is very wise. I think this is very smart stuff. Howard, this yeah. has been one of the great treats of StoryBeat to have you on the show for this amount of time. Thank you. And to get all this just phenomenal information and advice that uh, that I have now got in my library, which is very cool for me. Um, yeah. And so I, I thank you for well, coming on the show. Okay. You you are one of my favorite people from uh, all the thousands uh, of students I've had, Steve. Well, which, thank you. Which is why I agreed to do this. <laughs> So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. So I thank you so much, Howard, and, and, and have a great day. Thank you, Steve. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.